just can watch this afterwards. So um, welcome to our series called Prepare for Victory Virtual Medical Symposium Series. We created this program because we want to give you, no matter where you are in the world, the opportunity to hear the best information on genetic aortic conditions from our professional advisory board and other leading experts on these conditions. I want to thank our funder, um, the Chu and Chan Foundation, for making these webinars possible. They're very supportive of our programs and services, so I want to thank them. So before we get to our presentation, I'd like to introduce you all to Michael Weimer, the president and CEO of the Marsan Foundation, to welcome you. And I mean, there we go. Good evening, everybody. So, uh, I guess this is the first medical symposium of 2020. You know? <laughs> wow. That's pretty cool when you think about yeah. it. Yeah, I feel like it's an honor. Yeah, we're launching into another decade. And, uh, you know, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, as Eileen has mentioned or will mention, these have been a huge success. And one of the great things you can see them afterwards or hear them afterwards, which also adds to the uh, Ability to spread information. Uh, exciting time at the foundation uh, this year in July, early July, right around July 9th, we will have our annual conference up in Boston. So if you either love to come east or live in the east, uh, it's a great opportunity to spend time uh, with the Marfan Foundation and many of our community members. Um, Sylvia and, and most, if not all, of our PAB members. Our professional advisory board will, will be there for the weekend. Uh, so you have an opportunity to be with uh, 700 either new, old, or soon to be friends, uh, which is uh, a great opportunity. Uh, and I wanna thank, I wanna thank Sylvia as well uh, for coming by and doing this. Uh, have the greatest professional advisory board in the world. And Sylvia is one of those great members Anytime I think you, uh, you need something, you need help, you need advice, you can certainly go to Jan at our Help and Resource Center. And many of you also, I know, have contacts within our professional advisory uh, board as well. So with that, uh, Sylvia, thank you. Eileen, I'm going to be hanging out, uh, listening, but uh, let's have a great night. Great. Thank you so much, Michael, um, for being here with us tonight. So as you all know, um, tonight's presentation is on dental concerns in Marfan syndrome and related conditions. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box, which you can see on your screen. Um, we'll leave time at the end for those. You don't need, don't put them in the chat box, and also you don't have to raise your hand. Just type them in the Q&A box. Um, I do recommend that you wait till the end of the presentation to, to type them in, because Dr. Fraser Bowers may likely answer your questions um, in advance, but she's happy to answer them afterwards. So as Michael said, we are fortunate to have an outstanding medical expert on our professional advisory board to address these issues. Dr. Fraser Bowers um, is a clinician scientist, dentist scientist at, the, at UNC's School of Dentistry's Department of Orthodontics. Her research focuses on understanding the genet genetics behind how teeth and faces form. She came to UNC Chapel Hill to start a combined orthodontics residency and genetics PhD program in 1993 and is regarded as a respected researcher, educator, and mentor. Dr. Fraser Bowers has held various leadership positions in orthodontic and craniofacial biology fields, both locally and on the national level. Through these positions, she has advocated for diversity, equity, inclusivity, and social justice. So with that, I am going to um, stop sharing my screen and, and give her the remote control. Okay, so now I have to say, so good evening, everyone. Um, pardon my communicating here with Eileen, but I have to make sure I'm going to, uh-oh. Yeah, let me, I know I have to give you the remote, I have to give you the remote there. Okay, now I'm Okay, gonna, it went away. Okay, now I see it. So now I'm it. going to share, and with any luck, um, this should be... Yep. You're good. Hopefully seamless. Okay, um, I'm also going to be very mindful of the time. Um, if I get near the end and I have to rush a little bit, I want to re reassure everyone that I, I really did look through the content. I believe this is something that I can share as a PDF. So um, when I was asked to do Marfan and dental concerns, I always 
pause for a second because I am a dentist, but I'm also an orthodontist. And as you probably know about specialists from your own healthcare experiences, that we tend to be um, very focused on um, the special thing we do. But I've tried to make this informative talk one that captures uh, elements outside of orthodontics, obviously. And I've tried to um, just touch on some things that might be related to uh, other disorders outside of the Marfan syndrome, but the focus really will be of Marfan syndrome and the things that I've learned through being a member of the professional advisory board and just from being a clinician scientist. So you all interact, I believe, at the uh, annual meeting. I, I'm guessing that many on the call have been at the annual meeting. And this is a time where we provide our knowledge and expertise, but we also have an opportunity to learn from those of you who attend. I've been doing the dental workshop, I believe, dental concerns workshop since 2006. And I've had an opportunity to learn from everyone who attends that. Today's um, informative talk will be capturing some elements of, of me having that opportunity, as well as what I know of best practices in dentistry. So what I hope for today is that we're able to think about the dental features of specifically the Marfan syndrome, how it relates to the entire skeletal system, because um, as you know, the dental uh, apparatus fits within the skeletal system. And I want participants to have a better understanding of dental features, either whether you're someone who's at risk for Marfan syndrome or whether you're someone who has Marfan syndrome and you have to engage in specific oral facial management. And I also, I, I didn't put as much on the resources, but I have at least one paper that I want to share. Um, I just found just for this occasion, a uh, brand new January 2020 publication on um, managing, I guess, antibiotic prophylaxis and those who might need it and when and where and, and how we can maybe avoid that. So we think of Marfan syndrome as, as it's defined as a genetic disorder, and I'm not going to go over this exclusively, but I do want to sort of elevate the point that I am a clinician scientist, so I happen to have a PhD in genetics and molecular biology. And I like to think about things as having a genetic origin and when possible to be able to tie what I see clinically to that. I haven't had so much opportunity to do that genotype phenotype correlation work yet, but I'm also, I'm always mindful of that. And as you know, Marfan syndrome is a multi-system disorder. And I say this not because you need to hear it and you don't know it, but because I want to etch this in your brain that when we think about dentistry, we're thinking about the mus musculoskeletal system. The things that we think about aren't often teeth or the face in dentistry, but when you look at the musculoskeletal presentation, it does include things that we note more, which is the disproportionately taut thin stature and some other things. But there's also, this is where uh, dental falls. It falls within that skeletal realm. And frankly, regardless of whether this is a major criteria or not, because it is not, um, the face is not, but we know that most of us feel that we can detect Marfan or Marfanoid features just from looking at the face. And what else? We also know that there are other aspects of the musculoskeletal system that may be uh, relevant to dentistry. Again, we tend to think about feet or hands, um, other joints, but joint hypermobility has a strong correlation to the joint that helps you when you're chewing your food, the temporal mandibular joint. So we'll touch on that just a little bit. And we also know that even though the cardiovascular system seems like <clears throat> it wouldn't have anything to do with teeth. What we know is that depending on the 
health and condition of your cardiovascular system, you may be more prone to an infective endocarditis. And there's a strong correlation with the microbes or sort of flora in your mouth and the potential for that to have an impact on those that have some cardiovascular um, conditions that, that predispose them to infective endocarditis. So today we're going to be thinking about not just what Marfan looks like, but we're going to be thinking about it in the context of the patient and the provider. What does it look like? What do we need to think about as patients or, or you think about as patients and what do providers need to think about? There are many faces and presentations of the Marfan syndrome, but the reason why we care about that is because as clinicians, we may be faced by your question of, well, is this Marfan syndrome or is this Lois Dietz? And why do we care? Because the way we manage it may be different. Remember, diagnosis, proper diagnosis equals proper treatment. So understanding the difference between one or the other is very important in that context. For instance, um, even though I'm not going to spend a lot of time with Lois Dietz, we know that those individuals with Lois Dietz often will have a bifid uvula, not generally found in the Marfan syndrome, and also cleft palate, but not always. But again, understanding the pattern of growth and the pattern of development for an individual that has one condition versus another is very helpful in allowing us to treat it. So that's why we would, we would care. But Marfan syndrome in, in dentistry, just, just in general, can be tricky because many of the dental characteristics alone are common in the general population. And if you are in the category of not knowing whether you have the Marfan syndrome, something else, or maybe you don't have a syndrome at all, but somehow have, have features, that the absence of some dental characteristics does not rule out Marfan syndrome. But every year we are asked to think about how we can meaning, um, thoughtfully include dental features in how we diagnose. And dental characteristics in combination with major criteria may allow the dentist to be one of the first individuals who can refer you to the appropriate parties. So this is something, again, for the people on this call, likely not relevant because you are already aware. And what we think about when we see dental characteristics in ourself or family member may help us in terms of creating or understanding what the patterns are that we need to look for. So the teeth in Marfan syndrome have certainly received a lot of attention. I didn't put this in the presentation. I can always add it and give the PDF to Eileen, but the Marfan Foundation website has a very nice uh, pathway that you can use to get to understanding dental conditions. And one of the things that's there is what it is that you might expect, what the resources are that you might want to seek out, and what things are, are more of significant concern like antibiotic prophylaxis, for instance. So we know the things that people think about again, from the practitioner and from the patient side, when it comes to the Marfan condition is, are the facial features, we mostly think about that because we want to help aid in adding to the, the um, diagnosis and the armamentaria that people use to diagnose. Malocclusion, because the patients are concerned, just as anyone would be with how their teeth occlude, whether it's proper or whether it is aesthetically appealing. And antibiotic prophylaxis, because those who are at greater risk for cardiac um, or cardiovascular issues are very much um, in need of having antibiotic prophylaxis. But we don't want to over antibiotic, um, we don't want to over prescribe antibiotics because of the fact that 
it will lessen the efficacy of antibiotics in the future if we do that. So that's why it's such a big issue. So what are the most frequently asked dental questions for the Marfan syndrome and related disorders? I look at that as two categories. They're the questions that the patients have, and then they're the questions that providers have in order to help the patients and to be better providers. Patient FAQs, will I or my child need braces, simply because we have Marfan, they have Marfan syndrome and that's an expectation, that's, that's their question. Does Marfan always cause a narrow upper jaw? Will I need an expander and what type? Will I need jaw surgery? Does Marfan syndrome cause weak enamel? And do I need antibiotics prior to dental treatment? So what I am going to elevate are some of these questions, not all of them. I will tell you relative to the one question about weak enamel, we really don't know because the, the studies, the cohort studies have not been robust enough to answer that question in an evidence-based way. Even though anecdotally, I have patients all the time say, well, I have weak enamel and I have Marfan syndrome, so you know, is that connected? There's just not enough data um, to say that. But let's think about some of the other things um, and what doctors want to know. Most doctors, researchers, dentists want to know, can we better diagnose using some of the craniofacial dental features? Do we need to expect a specific response or a lack of response to dental and orthodontic treatment for patients with Marfan syndrome? And do we need to use a special treatment protocol for people with um, Marfan syndrome or related disorders? So thinking about that, how do we recognize craniofacial features in a systematic way that makes it so that we aren't being um, too anecdotal or too subjective? And one of those ways is using an anthropometric approach that allows us to measure the face. We'll talk about that some here. But before I do that, I want to really highlight what you probably already know, but it's worth saying. One of the common problems we see in the Marfan syndrome is overcrowded teeth. And again, I mentioned that we see this in the population anyway, but there is often an association that's even in the, um, Gant nosology that talks about the narrow upper jaw and the vaulted uh, depth owing to the narrow dimensions, and that leads to crowding. Related to that is something called a posterior crossbite. You have a narrow palate and you have the upper teeth that kind of sit on the inside of the lower teeth when you bite down, which is not a proper alignment or arrangement of the teeth, that is called a posterior crossbite. And so an example of a uh, narrow vaulted palate is shown here. Um, what I do wanna say is oftentimes you don't see people with this very specific deeply vaulted palate, but this is a more extreme example. Does a vaulted palate mean you're gonna have a dental crossbite? Oftentimes it is correlated. And why do we care about a crossbite? Because one of the bigger questions uh, that people always ask is, do I need to get this expansion now and why? Well, a crossbite could be because your upper jaw is too small, not just because the teeth are not arranged properly. And if you address it while the face and jaws are still developing, you are in going to be in a better situation. If you do not, it can cause, as you develop, the jaw to shift to one side, uh, lopsided jaw growth, which um, in sort of medical terms would be asymmetry. And this could cause a wearing down of the outer layer of uh, enamel, of the outer layer of the tooth, which is called enamel. So that may be why some people note that they have enamel that's wearing. But a crossbite, quite simply, is when the upper teeth are on the inside of the lower teeth. And that is something that, again, we want to fix sooner rather than later. And yes, you may often be told that you need to have expansion. For
for the reasons cited before that we don't want to have that individual develop as an adult with these problems that will manifest perhaps even the jaw problems that we might find for people who have uh, Marfan syndrome and joint laxity. So what else? The face is characteristic. And oftentimes we see the narrow face that sort of impedes the ability to have the facial harmony that we sometimes seek. And this separately could be, um, could show up with people who have problems with their TMJ. TMJ and facial characteristics have not really been studied rigorously, and that's, that's part of the dilemma when people ask questions. But we do know from studies of a typical non-syndromic cohort at UNC showed that certain people who were treated orthodontically are genetically more predisposed to TMD problems. So they had a certain haplotype that made them more likely to respond to orthodontic treatment by having TMJ, TMD problems. That is not very well studied in uh, a Marfan population. And it is not to the extent that these TMD problems are, um, at least in this cohort, are, are debilitating or um, something that we have to be concerned about um, from, in terms of needing a surgical intervention. What about gum health, periodontal disease? A lot of people ask that question. Again, the cohorts are not robust enough to know whether or not Marfan can really be attributed to causing periodontal disease. But just like anyone else, you can get periodontal disease. And the key or the other big issue is if you have Marfan syndrome or any other related disorder that has a cardiovascular component, having that level of bacteria that can easily enter the bloodstream just puts you at so much a higher risk. We know that plaque constantly builds up on and around and in between teeth, and you need to remove it. We know that there are different toothpaste that help. I try not to do a commercial here, but I will say that Peridontax and um, Crest Gum Detoxify are both toothpaste that have stannous fluoride that's more effective than sodium fluoride or, or monofluorophosphate toothpaste um, after you've had a professional cleaning. So I will elevate that type of toothpaste again without specifically advertising. Um, it, it is excellent for that purpose. There are other toothpaste out there that help in terms of those who feel they have weak enamel. I did not put that here. But again, I can add all of this stuff, in, um, especially if it comes out in the questions. But what we have to remember is your mouth is the mirror to your body. I have a link. I'm afraid to go to this link because you know, I'm not accustomed to, to sharing a screen. So I'm not going to go to the link. But your mouth is a mirror to your body. So regardless of whether we can say people with Marfan syndrome are more prone to perio disease or weak enamel, I think we can say regardless of who you are, we know that there's a connection between your oral health and your overall health. So it actually, the onus is more, um, or the burden is more on those with Marfan syndrome with those greater risks to just take extra special care. So one of the things I said is the doctors want to know different things. And, you know, in my training, um, one of my professors said our, our job is to search for the truth. And I used to be an X-Files fan. That's why you see that. And the truth is out there. So we need to search for that in terms of uh, helping us guide clinical diagnosis and improve management. And we do that through having cohort studies. So we actually examine craniofacial characteristics in a Marfan cohort by coming to several um, annual meetings in addition to serving in the clinic, but also asking certain people to be a part of uh, the study that we were conducting to look at craniofacial features. And our goal was to create a diagnostic rubric that might at some point be able to help clinicians when there's a borderline decision, perhaps. So we know that there are 
uh, craniofacial features of the Marfan uh, syndrome that are very characteristic. Um, some of them listed here. I'm not going to go through all of them, but you know and have heard of the downward slanting palpable fissures, um, the malar hypoplasia, which is kind of a flattening of the cheek, retrognathia, which usually means your lower jaw is smaller, um, dolicocephaly, which is a um, width of the head that's shaped a little different than than average. So there are a lot of studies that have already looked at this. There are studies by Ting et al. and they use photographs and they found that all of those features were more prevalent in Marfan subjects as, as compared to non-Marfan subjects. They also looked at the diagnostic value of skeletal features, and that's some, a name that's probably familiar. Dr. Sponseller et al. looked at subjects using the Ghent nosology and found um, that Marfan um, patients, 89.5% of them had cranial feature, facial features as compared to non-Marfan patients. There was a study, and it's, it's one of the few, that looked at a cephalometric analysis. This is what you get if you go to the orthodontist. It's really just looking at the jaws in relation to each other and the teeth in relation to each other and the jaws. And there was a finding that, indeed, the palatal vault height is greater in Marfan subjects, and the uh, maxilla, or the upper jaw, is shorter they're tended to be more likely to have a smaller lower jaw as well. So we wanted to take um, an opportunity with so many patients and experts while at the various meetings that we, we use that opportunity to evaluate subjects with Marfan, Lloyd's Dietz, and Ehlers Danlos. We didn't get enough of the subjects from um, the other populations outside of Marfan, so we couldn't really make conclusions. But we made facial measurements, we did photographs, and we did clinical exams and questionnaires. We based it on a plastic surgeon named Leslie Farkas, who has some norms for craniofacial measures by age and gender of the head and the face. And his study was an exhaustive study that looked at over 2,000 people, and it went up to 18 years old. And therefore, those norms that were created of facial measurements are for that age group. And those measurements were either going to be optimal, normal, supernormal, which means kind of too, too wide, or subnormal, meaning too small. And so... The purpose of, of today's information session is not to really get too into this, but just share with you there are these 12 measurements that we selected of those to look at. And we looked at patients in the cohort <clears throat> that totaled almost 40 patients over three years and found certain facial features were more prominent in photographs, for instance, the downward slanting uh, palpable fissures, um, the retrognathia, which means a smaller lower jaw, and dolicocephaly, for instance. And then we also did craniofacial measurements, so not just photographs, we did measurements. And we looked at the um, width between the eyes, the width of the face, meaning is it narrow? and the width of the nose. And those were the, the, the measurements that we found that were characteristically and statistically significant in terms of not being um, along the, the normative measurements for those who did not have Marfan uh, syndrome. We also looked just to see how many of our uh, cohort had some cardiovascular disorders, that wasn't as much of a robust finding. But the reason why we wanted to do that is we wanted to see, could we make any correlation with severity of craniofacial and cardiovascular diagnosis? And that, that was a bit of um, a hunch, but that didn't turn out to be relevant in that situation. 
We also looked to see how many of the subjects had ectopia lentis and not as many in our population as in others. Of the individuals who we looked at, the high arch palate and dental crowding was only in about 35%, but that's because we had a lot of young children in our uh, population. So I think some of them just didn't have it yet. Um, we also noted that if you were a person who was the first person diagnosed or proband, you tended to be diagnosed later in life. And the other three um, features that I mentioned before, the facial width, meaning you do have a narrow face, the um, width between the eyes and the width of the nose were significantly different from other populations. From the photographs, uh, I think this is just a summary of that. The eyes and the cheekbones were um, notably affected. We hypothesized that maybe the reason why we saw so many differences is because we had a bit of an age spread and we think that the phenotype may evolve with age and this may open up the door to newer, um, more robust studies in, in the future. So in the future, we do want to be able to look at um, three-dimensional photography and comb beam CTs. I know that Hopkins um, collaborated with, with actually one of my colleagues at San Francisco and they started that work. But what do doctors, dentists, researchers, and patients all want to know? They all want to know about infective endocarditis and orthodontic impl implications. And the latest data essentially says, and, and I'm gonna actually um, give the PDF of this paper, that really we don't have as much of a worry about bacter bacteremia as we used to probably because we're not even taking the old-fashioned molds where you put that in your mouth and we're now scanning with intraoral scanners. We are now using um, more streamlined braces that don't have the bands that go all the way around it like it used to. We're now using aligners where you don't even have to be as invasive to actually put an instrument or like I said, a band that might go under the gum line. So a lot of what we're doing now is really preventing the need to be as invasive and therefore um, reducing the likelihood that we really have to worry about infective endocarditis. But the bottom line, and you can read the paper, is that it really depends on the health status of the patient. And my recommendation is that you, again, keep your teeth extraordinarily clean so that the likelihood for bacteremia or things kind of flowing through your, your gums is gonna be lower. And finally, those who may have um, sleep apnea, there are appliances that can help uh, reduce the, the impact of that that are also often available through your, your orthodontist. And I think I'm at the end here. I wanted to make sure I got through everything, so. Great. Well, thank you, thank you. That was really, um, that was really informative. I, I definitely learned some things also there. So um, as we move on, I think you need to give me back the remote control. Okay, uh, I'll say no, stop. Okay, and then I will get back to my slides here. And um, before we move on to the Q&A, which we'll do in a minute, I want to talk a minute about Backpack Health because you, know, you talked frequently about the need to have bigger cohorts and have more studies to um, get more of the answers that people want on these orthodontic and dental questions. And through Backpack Health, which is um, an app that the Marfan Foundation offers. Um, it has actually has two purposes. One is to comp compile um, the health records for you and your family, um, and it does that securely and it's free. Um, and the other thing that it does is when you opt in to the registry, which is the first 
um, ever international patient registry on Marfan and related conditions, when you opt into that, your information is um, de-identified and aggregated with peop other people from the registry. So then research, researchers can then look back and try to get the information that will answer the questions that you all might have. And so um, to join that, um, you go to marfan.org. There's a backpack health icon at the top of the screen. We are currently in a campaign to try to get to 2020 uh, people in the registry by June 1st, 2020. It's convenient. Um, actually, this says 1377. We actually have a, we just got a few more, so we're at about 1381. So, um, if you would like to be part of that project, I would certainly um, encourage you to do so. So now, um, what we'll do is we will look at the Q and A's here. So let me pull up the Q and A box here. I see a few questions, and so I will pose those to um, Sylvia. Um, so, um, first question, how likely is it for an older adult with Marfan syndrome to successfully have bone grafting and implants done? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I am now officially older, which means I don't know exactly <laughs> what older is. Um, uh -huh. You know, I'm well over 40, so I don't, I, if we're talking about individuals that have um, other comorbidities, osteoporosis or something outside of Marfan, that's another concern. Or if there's someone who takes um, bisphosphonates, that's a different concern. But if, if there's not any of that and it's just a matter of needing um, an implant, an implant is very invasive, so you would need the clearance from the cardiologist. Because the things that I talked about were very common things. And a lot of times it, it, we used to grapple with, oh, do we need to um, do antibiotic prophylaxis? Because, you know, those things back in the day were more invasive, even though they were very common. Now those things are not invasive at all. So most of your dental visits are not going to require the le level of... Um, concern, but implants are something that it's possible to get, so the answer is yes, but mm -hmm. that would actually really require a careful assessment of that individual's health status relative to um, cardiovascular condition. Yeah, great, great point. Um, there's a question about hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which um, of course is one of the related conditions to Marfan. Um, I don't know if you have experience with anybody with hypermobile EDS, but um, if, you, if you do, do you see um, some of the same issues as Marfan or different issues? Yes, or actually, is that a different talk? <laughs> I find that I do see some of the same issues, but actually um, Ehlers-Danlos hypermobile seems to be greater, it, it seems to be um, an exacerbated presentation of some of the joint issues. So in other words, it's, it's actually worse. Um, and the long-term prognosis of treating it, whether it that actually might require surgery more than uh, someone who had Marfan to you correct. Mean like the the TMJ you're talking about? Correct, yes. Okay, okay. Um, but, but as every time I mention surgery, again, that's very invasive. There are people who have uh, Marfan syndrome and other related dis disorders who've had surgery, but they obviously have to, to be clear because that, that is um, very invasive. Okay, um, good answer there. Um, Another question, um, since Marfan syndrome involves connective tissue, is there a risk associated with periodontal surgery um, that the tissues do not, the word she uses, reform? Um, so do, is there a problem with healing? With no, surgery? I, have, I have never, I, I don't have, there's no evidence-based data, because that's the kind of stuff I look for, especially when I hear people asking that. You know, it's almost like I, I want to find it so I can, help, but I have seen no data that really indicates there's a um, specific um, delay in healing for those with Marfan syndrome. There is an Ehlers-Danlos type that has significant periodontal manifestation, but that is one type. 
but that that same type does not apply to the Marfan syndrome. <clears throat> okay. Great, thank you. Um, here's another um, EDS question, but this is somebody with VEDS, with Vascular Ehlers-Danlos. Um, I just want to say, Bridget, that um, we do have a new VEDS division, the VEDS movement, and I believe we might be doing something specific to VEDS on this topic. But um, let's ask your question anyway. Um, Bridget says she personally recognizes a lot of similarities between Marfan and related connective tissue disorders. She has VEDS, an extremely high palate, crossbite you mentioned, had crowded teeth, et cetera. Do you find that teeth are looser in this population or more shallowly rooted? She's um, afraid of losing teeth as she ages. Okay. So I actually have not, again, seen anything that indicates the VEDS population has a specific dental presentation. However, that doesn't mean it's, it's not true. I would think for... Um, the part, I'm sorry, did you say her name was Bridget? Yes, Bridget, yes. Um, I would say for your general dentist and whomever the periodontist is that they may re refer you to, get a good baseline. And then at your semi-annual visits, just have them assess whether you seem to be more prone to having problems or the word we use is refractory to treatment, meaning somehow you don't respond to treatment. That in and of itself, even though you're a sample size of one, would be an indicator that there's an issue, but there's not, um, I, I'm interested in how backpack can, can help because right now there's not a robust enough um, data set to make a claim that there's no evidence for. Right, one of those things that you see more people to look at it and so you can uh, study it. Right. Um, Joanne is asking about crowns versus veneers, I'm guessing, in Marfan syndrome. Is there a so, preference? Something, so something crowns are works? more invasive, mm -hmm. but the, the real indicator of whether you get a crown versus a veneer is the integrity of the tooth that is being crowned or veneered. A tooth that has a certain amount of tooth loss, damage, or um, shape issue, whatever the problem is, if it's enough of a significant amount, that would require a crown. A veneer probably wouldn't even be an option. But if you can have a veneer, if, if the dentist says that you have a tooth that would um, be a good candidate for a veneer, that would be better for Marfan because it's, it's less invasive. So the, so the, um, you know, the goal really is to be protective of um, anything um, harmful entering the bloodstream. Correct. Case. Correct. It's like, I mean, it's, I mean, you know, if someone didn't have any type of connective tissue disorder, I would still wonder why do the most invasive thing anyway? Right. If you, so it's really an assessment that needs to be made of that tooth's integrity, if it's significant or if it's um, minor or moderate, whichever the case may be. Okay. Um, here's another question about dental impl implants. Are they recommended or are bridges recommended after tooth removal? How about building bone before the implant? Do we heal well? And that's somebody bone grafting. Um, so these questions are also good, and the related ones make me feel like, you know, I need to see if, if there is any data I can find on that. Mm -hmm. That has not, to this point, been um, the canonical thinking on Marfan and bone and, and um, connective tissue. So I would not assume that that's the, the case. I think everyone's dentists can again use that person as their own baseline and then as their um as as a source for their own data so they can look at the person and then follow them over a year or two before they decide what to do and, and assess whether their health has been generally good okay great um okay let's see oh no i flipped through it too much okay here we go um, would it be typical for somebody with Marfan to have loss of gum tissue? Um, this person, this, she said she had eight implants about 14 years ago, and now six have failed. 
at 12 plus years out and my gums have just, just disappeared. And you can almost see jawbone around the amazing implants and the implants show the metal threads. I mean, is this Marfan mm-hmm. or is this individual or, um, you know, not everything I guess is associated with Marfan, but have you seen yeah. this in Marfan? I find that very interesting. I'd be curious to know when the implants were placed. The mm-hmm. science behind implantology has significantly um, improved over the past decade. Um, if you got your implants in the 90s, the likelihood of failure is greater than if you got your implants five years ago. So that actually is very significant. And as far as implant failure in general, for those that have been placed in you know, the new millennium, typically the failure rate had gone down quite a bit. So um, I'm, I'm, that number six of eight is kind of, um, is kind of surprising. So maybe there is a connection. And this is actually a good, this is a good place for something like backpack. Because if you see that show up a lot, then maybe that is something that is untapped in, in our current um, databases. Very good point. So you brought up on a slide wearing um, a mouth guard while doing contact sports, but we were told absolutely no contact sports. Um, so <laughs> um, Michelle's asking, can you clarify about contact sports with Marfan and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome? Okay, I didn't have, I don't remember a slide with a mouth guard. There was a sleep okay. apnea. Um, yes. I must, I don't know. I didn't talk about a mouth guard at all. Okay. All right. So, Michelle, that maybe you saw the mouth guard. Maybe, maybe you saw a picture from the sleep apnea slide that you thought was a mouth guard because you are correct. I mean, contact sports are um, generally um, um, not recommended for people with Marfan. So, right. That, the sleep apnea appliance kind of looks like that. That may right. be what, but I, and, and I also had Invisalign, which is a different thing you put in your mouth. Um, right. But there should be no mouth guard in, in the whole um, presentation. If it was in that mark on the description page, it maybe could have been, you know, where we talk about dental concerns. Mm-hmm. I don't, if, if so, I don't remember that being there, but that would just be a precaution if you're doing anything physical. But I, honestly, I don't remember ever having right. any mention of that. I don't either. But what, since you mentioned sleep apnea, I just want to let anybody on uh, who's on know that um, um, Dr. Enid Neptune recently did a um, webinar on lung issues and included asthma, but also sleep apnea as it relates to pulmonology. So you can go back and look at our um, webinar recordings and you can pick up more on sleep apnea there. Yeah, and, um, and what, what the American Dental Association has, um, has uh, stated in a white paper that the, um, the person who manages sleep apnea should be someone like Dr. Neptune, but the orthodontist or dentist can work with them in terms of providing devices if that doctor says they think that's a good way to go. So I didn't show it as a singular means of treatment, but it is an adjunct if your um, MD refers you. Okay, great. Um, Are traditional metal braces or Invisalign less invasive? We're talking about what's going to be the safest for somebody with Marfan. Invisalign would be less invasive, and Invisalign has been getting better and better and better and better, and it can do a lot. There's even Invisalign um, if you need surgery. So traditionally, if you needed surgery, you would have to have braces first. That would stabilize you so that after the surgery, they kind of wire things together. Um, but now there there are um, protocols in place where you can use Invisalign. Okay. Um, okay, here's another VEDS question. Um, somebody with VEDS, she said she no longer gets numb for dentistry. Her mom's front teeth fell out, no cavities, her mouth full of fillings. Her son's teeth became very brittle in his 40s. Is this VEDS related or is, is it maybe just in their family? Wow. Um, or you just haven't seen a lot of ads to know that. Yeah, is, um, I, I haven't. And, you know, yeah. what I don't see, I try yeah. to, um, I try to, you know, research. 
Yeah. And and the big big issue is that there's just not they're just not big enough cohorts because you never know when these associations are spurious. If in fact it is because it's that family or, I mean, there has to be a, a big enough cohort to answer that question adequately. Okay, great. All right. Um, we're going to, um, I think there's people are, are kind of like following up on some of the last um, um, and some of the last questions about implants is a lot about that, but I think you've answered all of these. Um, so I can I can actually ask um, the benefit. The one thing I didn't elevate much in my talk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is one of the big resources is is the literature. Now that we have, you know, we're more than two decades into the um, World Wide Web, so we can get all types of information there. But the next thing is associating with an academic health center. And I am at an academic health center. And I will actually ask one of my close colleagues that I'm gonna to see tomorrow, who's a periodontist, and he does periodontal surgery, what the current best practice is for individuals with um, cardiovascular issues and the risk associated, and whether there is any known um, contraindication or higher risk for having bone grafting and implants. I do not know of it, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So right. um, <laughs> it's, it's possible that there is an issue and I would like to find that out. So when I give you the, the PDF, you'll have maybe some, a little more in it. Great. That's really helpful. All right. Um, and I want to let everybody know we are going to send out a follow-up email with the recording and um, a lot of the resources mentioned here. And Dr. Frazier Bowers talked about getting some papers. Normally, I like to send this right out, but um, we're probably going to probably look for it next early next week, so we have some time to pull those pieces together for you and we get you the most complete information. Um, so before we um, before we close this out. I just want to tell you about some other things that are coming up. Oops, I got to get rid of that. Um, that some other things that are coming up, and um, ways that you can get connected to the foundation and meet other people as well. We have our walks for victory all over the country, as you can see. Um, what's new is our virtual walk. So if you are not in any of these cities or not near any of these cities where there are walks, you can participate in our virtual Walk for Victory. Um, that's May 2nd, and you can do that from anywhere in the world. Um, go to our website, um, marfan.org slash walk. Um, next, I want to tell you about, I don't know why I'm having trouble clicking these things. Um, we have regional symposiums. So we like the webinars because you can, you know, sit home, be in your pajamas, you can be anywhere you want. But we also have this great opportunity with regional symposiums. You can hear experts like Dr. Fraser Bowers and many others in different um, specialties. And they're one day and you get to hear different talks and meet people from your area who also have um, your diagnosis. And those are the dates of those symposiums. Next up is Portland, Oregon in March. We have our Camp Victory, um, Big Camp Victory for Families, and Camp Victory just for kids. And these have activities that are adapted for um, kids with Marfan and related conditions. There's a Marfan knowledgeable nurse on staff, and we have had rave reviews for these camps. So um, Winder, Georgia is a repeat, and our newest one is in Clarksville, Ohio. Next, um, Michael mentioned earlier our annual conference coming up in Boston. Those are the dates. Those are the the co-hosts, Boston Children's Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Registration will be up, I am told, mid to late February. So you will certainly be hearing from us about that. Um, I also want to let you know if, um, you're, if you have a, a child with Marfan or related condition and they are going to be hospitalized, we have this Sydney Lerman Pediatric Hospitality Program, and that's Sydney on the left with her older sister. Um, and they provide um, boxes like what you see here to bring cheer to kids who are in the hospital. And that is on our website as well. Um, finally, also, as Michael mentioned, if you have more questions, um, Jan Lynch, the nurse in our Help and Resource Center, um, is always available to answer questions. Well, not always. She goes home at night. Um, but there's her contact information. Um, you can also go to Ask a Question page. Oh, I didn't change the slide, but this should be at marfan.org. Um, that was from the last webinar, sorry. <laughs> but um, Jan Lynch, and there's her email address. Our next webinar um, is Pregnancy and Marfan Syndrome, um, and that's featuring Melissa Russo from Brown University. 
Um, on the VED side of thing, Melissa is also doing one um, in February on pregnancy and VEDs. So that's through the VEDs movement, and you'll be hearing directly from um, Katie Wright about that. So um, you can register on our website for um, these webinars and also look at the recordings of the previous webinars. So I want to thank Dr. Fraser Bowers for her time tonight and thank you all for participating. I know she's going to be getting us lots of information that we can share with all of you um, as follow-up to this webinar. Um, and again, as I said, we'll send out the link to the recording. We're always welcome for your feedback and any other suggestions for topics that you'd like us to cover. So um, with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Fraser Bowers. And uh, thank you. It was my pleasure. And um, thank you all for joining. And we are on time. And have a great night. All right. Everyone, good night.